Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeff Rosen, the president of this great institution, the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And in these polarized partisan times, when we see the mechanisms of democracy working themselves out before our eyes, it is so important to have a space like the National Constitution Center that brings together people of different perspectives and backgrounds to debate the meaning of the electoral process and the Constitution. And we are so thrilled in that spirit to be opening this beautiful new exhibit today headed for the White House that I really hope you'll all go see before or after the show. And great thanks to Stephanie Ryer and our wonderful team for putting that together. And we are launching a series of remarkably rich conversations about the presidency that will take place all fall, all spring, and lead up to the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention this summer. So in the next few weeks, we have election law scholars, Edward Foley and Richard Hassan, communication scholars, Jeff Cowan and David Greenberg, Jacob Weisberg, the presidential biographer of Lincoln, Sean Wallentz and Sidney Blumenthal on Lincoln and the history of the um, economic populism in America. And it's just gonna be nonstop presidential discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, we could not be more fortunate than to have with us two of uh, undoubtedly America's greatest presidential historians. Both have honored the Constitution Center by coming here before, and we are just thrilled that you will have the chance to hear from them tonight. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce them briefly, and we're gonna begin our conversation. Annette Gordon-Reed is Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard. Uh, she is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, she is America's leading scholar of Jefferson, and I was so excited to just get the galleys of her next book, which will be out in the spring, which is called Most Blessed of Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. Jeffrey Ward is America's leading biographer of the Roosevelts. He is collaborator with Ken Burns on a series of 27 PBS documentaries, including most recently, The Roosevelts and Intimate History. I just need to put in a personal plug for his spectacular books on Roosevelt, Before the Trumpet uh, and A First Class Temperament, as well as Closest Companion. I've read them all many times, they're that good, but if you wanna start and you haven't yet encountered Jeffrey Ward's wonderful books, begin with Before the Trumpet. You can do it chronologically and then you'll just learn so much about that greatest of president. There is in the exhibit a poll about who is the greatest American president, Washington, Lincoln, or Roosevelt, and as of uh, 6.45 p.m., Lincoln was edging out Roosevelt by about three votes, but it was kind of neck and neck with Washington. I'm gonna do what I can. Third, yes, <laughs> exactly. You gotta cast your vote. <laughs> so we have so much to discuss, but really, let's focus on campaigns and the, the, their constitutional legacy, but basically America's most contested campaigns. And Annette Gordon-Reed, you have written so importantly about Jefferson and the election of 1800 was one of our most contested. Mm -hmm. Why was it so contested? What happened and what was its constitutional legacy? Well, it was the beginning of the two-party system in the United States. I mean, the original idea was, the thinking was, that you could have um, a, a government, um, a political system without parties. But as soon as Jefferson gets back from France and joins Washington's cabinet and encounters Alexander Hamilton, he realizes that that's not possible, <laughs> that there would be parties. And uh, by the time we get from the 1790s, the, one of the most contentious parts, uh, points in American history, as they're battling, uh, party battling, without actually acknowledging that they are parties and feeling sort of a cognitive dissonance or some ambivalence about it, we end up with the Federalists and Jefferson, the Democratic Republicans that become the Republican Party, at odds with one another. And Washington, as the president, had held things together during his terms. Adams was a one-term president, somewhat you know, problematic. Uh, not as popular, obviously, as Washington, without the backing that Jefferson had. And so the, the battles, we had a, you know, the Quasi War with France, there were really contentious issues during the 1790s, and they all come to a head. In the, about in the election of 1800, and it's sort of a, the first peaceful transfer. I mean, the first thing that happened is Washington leaves, which people didn't think 
would happen. The next thing that happens, the big thing that happens, is you go from one party, the Federalist, to the Republican Party under Jefferson, very, very close. There was a tie with Aaron Burr, and it had to go to the House to, be, to settle it after a number of ballots. It was contentious because the issues were so contentious. The new country is trying to decide who they were, and they had a sense of who they were at the beginning, and then they broke apart. And it was just very, very tough for everybody to, to settle on, on where they should be. And they settled on Jefferson. And he promised to sink federalism into an abyss, and which he actually did, as a matter of fact. By the time the Jeffersonians are done, the Federalist Party is gone during the era of, uh, of good feelings. Uh, and the, you know, the Republican Party is victorious up until, well, you know, we have a brief interlude with John Quincy Adams, but then Jackson comes in and he considers himself to be a Jeffersonian. So it was, it was a lot at stake. And any time a lot is at stake, it's going to be contentious. That's a, a great uh, introduction. Um, Jeffrey Ward, as Annette has described it, things were pretty polarized and partisan back then. Is it possible to say whether or not things are more polarized now or not? That's a tough one. I, I don't know enough about those days to answer that really. Um, uh, certainly the, uh, I think the abuse was worse then. You'd know about far better than I. It, the abuse was pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, John Adams is a political hermaphrodite. Someone described him. Uh, of course, Jefferson and the whole thing with Calendar and Sally Hemings. And yeah, there was a lot of dirt being slung back in that time period now. It, it's amazing how fast that happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I understand, I, maybe I'm wrong. As I understand it, George Washington never said he wanted to be president. Mm -hmm. He was simply made president. Mm -hmm. And that, that is so far from what happened 10 minutes later, yes. that it's amazing. Well, I mean, he'd been the commander in chief, and he, yeah. he did show up at the, in, you know, with his in full regalia to the Continental Army, and he was the tallest. I mean, Jefferson's a little bit taller than he, but he was tall and commanding and very much respected, and so he was sort of a natural person. But as you're right, after that, I mean, in the, in the play Hamilton, there's this wonderful moment when King George III says, you know, I know him. They tell him what's going to happen, and they say, well, are they going to keep changing whoever's in charge is the, uh, the, the line. And he tells him it's John Adams. And he's like, you know, what? <laughs> Who is this guy? They, they don't seem as, they don't loom as large as, as Washington. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So the election of 1800 goes to the House. And then the um, election of, uh, between uh, Jackson and uh, Quincy Adams goes to the House as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's one more, which I learned from the exhibit I'd forgotten about, the election of 1888, Cleveland Harrison. Mm -hmm. uh, Cleveland wins the popular vote, but loses, but, 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 but um, uh, that goes to the House as well. The framers expected mm -hmm. most of the elections to be settled in the House because they thought that no candidate would get an electoral majority. Was that a good uh, expectation, and how did that play out? Well, I mean, they didn't expect the beginning that they were didn't know what to do with the tie. I mean, you know, the, that's not what they expected. I think they were sort of favored the House as a representative of the people and so forth. But I think they thought it would might run smoothly. Uh, didn't understand what you know what would happen uh, if there if there was a tie. Um, and there had to, and they also thought that the first place winner would be president, and the second place winner yeah. would be vice president. Yeah. And had to amend the constitution because that didn't work out yeah, too well no. that was not either. A good plan. That was not a good plan. Yeah. You, if you think about think about it in modern times, how that how that could turn out. You know, Bush and Gore, Obama you know, and Cheney, Obama and, Ch <laughs> <laughs> and Bush. Um, Eighteen uh, twenty, John Quincy Adams gets the presidency based on Henry Clay's deal in the House. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jackson charges a corrupt bargain. Mm -hmm. T tell us about that. Question. Well, yes, he thought it was a corrupt bargain that he agreed to su you know, support him if he could become Secretary of State. Um, Jackson wins, is tremendously popular. Um, the Battle of New Orleans, that he sort of becomes an iconic figure from that, and there was every expectation he thought that he could win. And he thought that he'd been done out of of, um, of the um, of the election. That was one of the first election, I should say, where people are really sort of campaigning. He had operatives who were actually campaigning for him. During Jefferson's era, we talk about the 1790s, people weren't supposed to be seen as campaigning. That was thought of as ambitious. And ambition, even though they were all incredibly ambitious, 
ambition was seen as a bad thing. So and by the time we get to the Jackson era, people actually are, you know, he has people putting things, you know, in newspapers campaigning for him in ways that um, had not, you know, openly in the way that had been done before, much more surreptitious. But he's not campaigning. No, no, he's not campaigning. And that, I think, was all the way to William Jennings Bryan. No, no. Before, I mean, until then, presidents and, and would-be presidents did not leave their home because it was thought unseemly, mm -hmm. if you can imagine it, having watched the debates the last few weeks. Um, <laughs> that word, unseemly. Yeah. They thought it was simply, you know, bad manners and wrong and looked bad. Mm -hmm. Well, they're sort of modeling themselves after in, in a strange way. If you think about it, sort of Roman, the Greeks sure. and the Romans, it's some sort of mythical understanding of what, what that democracy yeah. was like. And they were, you know, Cincinnatus. I mean, that's the, you know, uh, the person who leaves office, who only comes out to serve the people. It's not about own, his own right. personal ambition, even though, as I said, they were all incredibly ambitious. So my, we, my favorite of those things we talked about earlier is Abraham Lincoln, who liked when people came to his office to talk about politics, he would almost always say, I know nothing of politics. Mm -hmm. And people, half of them believed him, which is really yeah, amazing. Because no. <laughs> that's a, he Not was a true. very shrewd politician. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about Lincoln. Of course, we think about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but those were not presidential debates. They were senatorial debates. So f did Lincoln himself campaign for president? No, he did not. He made a speech uh, in uh, New York, which everybody liked, and he had his photograph taken by Matthew Brady, which everybody liked, mm -hmm. and that went around, but he did not campaign. He mm -hmm. never made a speech during the presidency, during the presidential campaigns, mm -hmm. either one of them. So how did the 1860 campaign play out? Who would have spoken on his behalf, and who would have, uh, how, did, how did he get elected? Republican spokesman. Republican who, spokesman, I mean, yeah. people, you know, people who, newspaper his, his newspaper editors and so forth carried yeah. the, the words. People used to be able to read in this country. Uh -huh. <laughs> they did a lot of that. They did a lot of it. <laughs> um, why was the quality of written debate so much higher. I've heard it suggested, uh, the historian Sid Blumenthal in his Lincoln book says that the quality was higher because people read the King James Bible and they taught themselves to read with that cadence and therefore they had longer attention spans and that's why the debates in the Senate about the Constitution were of higher quality. More thoughts about that? I think that's true. They read Shakespeare too. I mean, they, they read good stuff and they were expected to really understand it. They read good stuff. I, I, I will put in a plug for people today. We're, we're pretty smart. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's not to in any way take away from the, you know, the, you know what we think of, of people in the past. I mean, except for Lincoln, who was pretty self-taught. I mean, he's really yeah. an amazing, amazing intellect, yep. an amazing writer for someone who didn't have a formal education. Jefferson, you understand, because you know he had the best education that could be offered in Virginia and so forth, and they were members of the elite and so forth. But if you think about the fact that half the population was kept out of competition, that is to say women, um, huge sections of uh, people of color were not allowed. So you have... It's easy to be a giant when everybody else is forced to be small, you know, and um, not to say it's, you know, they were I I extraordinary people, but we have a much le more a level playing field, and I think it's harder for anybody to really, really stand out with so many talented people who are out there. But certainly reading Shakespeare and reading the, the King James Bible, those kinds of things. I get letters from my grandmother. I think mm -hmm. about, I look at old letters from my grandmother who didn't have an extensive education, and they are as good a quality as some of my students. Sure. I mean, it's just because they paid yep. attention to that kind of thing, and um, it was it was very important. Well, they also had practice. I mean, we don't write anymore. Yeah. You know, emails mm -hmm. is what we write now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and it's very hard to write if you don't read. The, the point yeah, you made right. before, reading, exactly. to being a good writer requires yeah. uh, reading. And I think a lot of people want to write, but they don't want to read, and that's that's tough. You're uh, so good to call our attention to the restriction of the suffrage and its gradual expansion. And one of the very moving things about the exhibit is in any election, you can see whether you could have voted at that election if you yeah. were a woman, if you were a minority, and just seeing the gradual expansion of the suffrage mm -hmm. is inspiring. Let's talk about the election of 
1912, because Je Jeffrey, you've written, of course, about Theodore Roosevelt. There we had a third party candidate in Roosevelt who got a higher percentage of the popular vote, 27%, than the incumbent Republican William Howard Taft who got only 25%. Wilson, 41%, has an electoral college basically landslide, suggesting you need at least 35 or 40% to get a majority. But tell us about Theodore Roosevelt and what his doomed but noble third party run did to the election of 1912. Well, I think it was a mix of nobility and ambition, uh, which is what all politics is, I think. I mean, he was a, uh, uh, we were talking earlier. I think nowadays, somebody in our film actually said he would be in, on Ritalin if he were, <laughs> if he were alive today. Um, I think he couldn't stand not being president. And he, um, and he was enraged at himself because he had promised not to run for a third term and he had a, and it wasn't really a third term because he was living out half of the, of the McKinley term that put him in office. Um, and I think he, and again, you know, uh, everybody rallied to him until it looked as if they weren't going to win and then all, a lot of the people who had urged him to do it fell away because they had hopes of staying in the Republican Party. Um, it is very hard to do a third party. It's just very hard. I hope the mayor of New York uh, <laughs> understands that because it's, uh, you can spend an awful lot of money and not well, get He's got there. a lot of money. He does. <laughs> he does. If, if you were advising the mayor based on the history of third parties, what would you <laughs> tell him? Should he run or not? Depends what he wants to do with his money. <laughs> I, he wants to win, so he doesn't want to run if he's not. I, I, I don't think away. he could. I, well, it's just, my opinion, he couldn't possibly win. I don't think he, I think in some ways he, he's not Chris Christie, but there's a kind of New York person that doesn't work past Ohio. <laughs> and, uh, I may be Thanks wrong about that. Thanks a lot. from the Upper East Side. That's <laughs> what I think. So am I. <laughs> I'm not you're, running. You're, yeah. <laughs> and it depends on what he wants to have happen, True. too. If he True. doesn't win, I mean, who does he want to win? And who does he want to help? Who does he want to hurt? from all of this. So he's, there are a lot of things to, to consider there. There's a riveting um, diagram in the exhibit of the major parties and how the, how the Federalists and uh, Democratic Republicans morphed into the Whigs and the Democrats and Republicans. But they have the splinter third parties throughout American history in every election from the know-nothings to the Tea Party. To there the were Republican a, Party. To, to, yeah. Yes. Yeah. There, there are a whole lot of them. So it could work sometimes. Yeah. We'll say more about that. How did well, we I mean, the Republican Party was a third party, and uh, it, but it, and it, and it didn't do very well the first time, and it did well enough to win the second time. Because of slavery, is, is, are the Whigs yeah. splitting apart that over slavery? Mm -hmm. And um, so, so it isn't true that it doesn't work, but it is very difficult, and there are very special circumstances. I think have to be involved. C could you imagine, in our lifetimes, the current? party system having a new realignment and one of the parties splitting off and a new one being created, a new majority party. Oh, oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, we seem to be in that, that's what's going on now. There's a real split in the Republican Party between mm -hmm. evangelicals, um, fundamentalists, and you know, moderate Republicans, do whatever you want to do, but don't do it with my money um, type people. And that's very, very pronounced now. And I think they are sort of reeling at this point, uh, you know, at, at figuring out what, what has happened here, how have we let it get to this point. So definitely we could, we could have another party. We think we could split off. We sort of tend to think that everything remains the same, but as, as, the, as your chart shows, there are evolutions and people, the coalitions fall apart and break apart. And yeah. There could definitely be some other yeah. uh, splintering. I, I think there's also a strain you can see both in the mayor's plans and in Mr. Trump, th there are people who the word politician is an evil word mm -hmm. and a good, solid businessman can do the job. Mm -hmm. that's, I, I think that's been a strain for a long time. Uh, years ago, I was asked to make, <laughs> make a speech at Gettysburg, not on the battlefield, but at a convention of some kind. Mm -hmm. And it was when, um, was his name? What was the Texas businessman who ran? Twice? Perot. Ross Perot. Yeah, Ross Perot was running. And I thought he was an absurd person. Forgive me, but I did. And uh, I made a speech 
in which I said in the two worst crises in American history, the Civil War, Civil War era and the Depression, the United States had turned, thank God, to incredibly skillful politicians. Now, the Civil War had just been on TV, and David McCullough was the narrator of the script that I wrote. Two people came up to me afterwards. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, uh, two people came up to me afterwards, and I thought I'd made a very good case for politicians, because I really believe that. The first person came up and said, I loved your speech. It sounded just like David McCullough. That was the first one. And the, and, and the second one came up and said, I know what you're trying to say, Ross Perot. So you, there you, can't, you can't convince those people. That politicians are, uh, that's an honorable profession, I think. Well, and if, if Sean had been here tonight, he would have also defended partisanship because his new book is about the fact that we, always, we say we decry pol partisanship, but that's what it's about. Politics really matter. I mean, and that's why the 1790s were so contentious. What kind of country is it going to be? Will it be a manufacturing country, or will it be a country where people are primarily farmers? That's not, and how do we do our trade policy? How does this work? You can't, you, sometimes you have to fight, you know? You, you do have to fight, and partisanship is not necessarily a dirty word. I mean, you don't, if, if the ideals matter to you, and if you have a passion about things, you're going to collide with people who have a differing vision. And from that, you might be able to, you will get something good. So poli people think politicians are bad. People decry partisanship. But that's how things, in the, fa in the battle, that's how things actually get done. When people decry partisanship today, they express concern that compromise is not possible. And they note that in the old days, even FDR would appoint a Republican chief justice to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and Congress was able to do deals. And now it's, it seems that both sides just won't talk to each other. And the claim is that this wasn't what Madison envisioned. Is there anything to that, or is that just nostalgia? Well, it, there's some nostalgia to it. There's something about the way districts are drawn now so that people cannot be voted out, and people are there permanently. That makes a, that makes a difference, because if you don't, if you feel that you you can't lose your seat. You have nothing to lose by, uh, you know, by being recalcitrant, and things can kind of roll forward. I, I do think that that is different. But we've gotten ourselves into a position now where, you know, house seats and, and things are not up for grabs, and people don't feel the, you know, the possible fear, the possible wrath of the people because it's hard to get people out. Money is a big influence. I mean, could you imagine if you were explaining to Madison or any of these people that, yes, well, there are these people who give money to these folks, and but it's not bribery. It's, it's oh, their no. speech or whatever. I mean, they would be, I mean, you know, we're channeling these people, but I, I could sort of, I mean, from everything I've read about them, they would be aghast at that. They would think that that was corruption. They're always talking about corruption. So money and districting, the way the lines have been drawn that keep people out of, uh, you know, real contest, I think that is a different thing. Because there, there's no reason to compromise if you, if, you're gonna, if you think you're going to stay in your spot no matter what. There's another phenomenon that politicians and others point to that's new, and that's social media, which tends to polarize and lead to extreme positions and make uh, minority views harder to express. Is that changing things in a serious way? I'll ask I Jeff. think so. I, I mean, I think media in general have changed things. I, I, well, if you read about, I mean, I've read a lot about Franklin Roosevelt, obviously, and there's a problem, and it is resolved or not resolved over a period of time. He does not express an opinion that he wants in the newspaper until he's thought about it. You can't do that now. You, you, you have to have an opinion, and then you have to defend the opinion, and then the opinion becomes a, uh, an event. And... Uh, it, I, I cannot imagine what it must be like to be present now. Yeah, the news cycle is so, it's I mean, crazy. at first it was, you know, I was in high school. If you think about cable news, we thought cable news was something. Oh, 24-hour yeah. news, yeah. you know, as opposed to gathering together at 5.30 or 6.30 and watching, you know, the evening news. And so you have a 24-hour cycle. But now with Twitter and with social media and yeah. Facebook, I mean, the, the news, a thing could happen and it could run its course in 20 minutes. 
Yeah. You know, it, it starts off it, it trending, it needs to apex, and then it begins to go down. So you're constantly, and then go on to something else. It's yeah. so, so fast. It's and, they, and they have to be up on all this stuff, because if you don't pay attention to it, yeah. things can get away from you really, really easily. You need to react immediately. React, uh, yeah. Think about that r uh, remarkable scene in uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy, where Jimmy Cagney is playing FDR, dancing up a storm. He's doing this tap dance routine. And it's all, that's off the record. That's off the record. Yeah. It no, doesn't exist anymore in the social no. media. Yeah. He had, uh, uh, you know, two, two press conferences a week. He had an unbelievable number of them. He was in complete control of them. Uh, it, was all, it all took place in his office. All the reporters would come in, and he'd ask them how their weekend was, and how's your wife, and uh, are you going to come to the picnic? And then they would, he would invite questions, and there were whole categories of questions he wouldn't answer. He, that's an iffy question. He'd say, I don't answer iffy questions. <laughs> Can you imagine a politician <laughs> doing that now? And then he would say, now I'm going, to, I'm going to explain that to you, but not one word of this can leave this room, and it didn't. It, and it is amazing. The amount of control that a president had routinely, really up until quite recently, uh, the Kennedy White House was like that. Um, uh, the, a lot of stuff, it was thought okay for it to be kept kept among themselves until a decision was made or a plan was made. Tell and I suppose, you know, you can say, you can be a sort of transparency absolutist. I'm not sure it works better. I also, I'm, I'm gonna just, what the hell, I'm gonna. <laughs> um, this primary business, I, I'm old enough to remember backroom deals and big city bosses, they did not pick worse candidates. <laughs> they did not. Well, that raises, on a, on a nonpartisan basis, the question, the question of whether the process has become too democratic or more democratic than the framers would have expected, more responsive to the polls and public opinion. Are Certainly we seeing more than they expected? More than right? they expected. Oh, yeah, definitely more democratic than they expected. I yeah. mean, they had a, an idea of a group of people. I mean, Jefferson and Adams in particular, um, Hamilton even more so, of a notion of a natural aristocracy, not... Uh, you know, by birth, but by talent or whatever. I mean, the idea that you would have, you know, John Kerry afraid to speak French in public yeah. because people wouldn't like him. You know, it's just exactly. awful. That's I mean, they would, they, would, they would think it's, you know, they, would, they yeah. spoke numerous languages and they thought it was a good thing to be educated. Yeah. And now that's a problem. He can't yep. speak French. I mean, he's sort of furtively, I think he's sort of, as Secretary of State, he actually gave a press conference where he did, in fact, when mm. he was in Paris, speak French. Uh, but before, when he's running for president, he has to hide that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't think they would have thought democracy defined in that way, democracy as people who, are, who aren't aspirational, um, that is not what they thought. I, I do think that they would have, uh, uh, would have expected there to be a sort of leadership class of people that, that you choose from. Everybody could aspire to be in it. I mean, with of course, if you were a white guy, but those people could uh, aspire to it. And sort of taking yeah. off from that as, the, as this is expanded, the idea is that you get into that position, not just that anybody on the street can be president. They wouldn't have expected that, I don't think. Not that we have anybody on the street being president running now, but you know what I mean. They also feared that democracy without constitutional checks could lead to mob rule. And they cited Aristotle and ancient theorists for this. Are their fears being vindicated? That's an iffy question. It's okay. It's an iffy question. It's off the record. <laughs> off the record. Couldn't leave this room. <laughs> Someone, someone, maybe. Yeah, let's see what we think. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, sure. I mean, it's a danger. I, I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there yet. I, but that's, I, you do. Uh, there are some rallies this year that I have found frightening. Um, I have to say, uh, when people get beaten up at 
at large gatherings of thousands of people and it's encouraged from the podium, that's scary to me. And it's reminiscent of, I'm not sure it's mob rule, to me it's reminiscent of a lot of stuff that happened in the 40s and scares me. That's just me. In, in the 40s, that was obviously going on in Europe. But yeah. America has not had <laughs> that tradition. Here we had uh, Huey Long. Tell us about him and how he's an antecedent to some of the populism we're seeing today. Well, uh, Huey Long was somewhat of a threat to Franklin Roosevelt in the, in between 1934 and 1936 when he was uh, assassinated. Um, but he didn't, uh, and he was a populist and he had sort of crazy schemes to make feel, people feel better. Every man was gonna be a king and so on. But he didn't hate anybody. Um, he didn't, he wasn't telling groups of people anything. He was remarkable on race for a man of his time. Uh, he was much better than any other southern governor. Um, uh, so I, I, don't think it, I don't think it's quite the same, but it is the same um, sense that I hear how miserable you are and there are people who are making you miserable and I can replace them was certainly there. Uh, as I hear both of you talk, I'm suddenly getting nostalgic for political parties. We learned from the exhibit that delegates to conventions were not chosen by primary until the 1970s, really. It, it started in the progressive era, but it wasn't until the 70s that most delegates were chosen by uh, primaries. But it seemed like a time when primaries, when parties had more control over who got uh, chosen was one where, Jeff, you suggested wasn't the worst system in the world. Um, should should, should uh, we try to restore the power of the parties? No, I don't, th I don't think it's possible. But I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember George McGovern. Um, and I'm also old enough to be one of the people who marched in the street and I wanted him to be president and so on. We produced Richard Nixon. So it is, it is very tricky. Nixon's stuff. the one, absolutely. There's a great, you can hear the song in the, in the exhibit. I wasn't, I don't know sure whether there was applause for Richard Nixon <laughs> or for... Or Come on, Everett. <laughs> he was a shy and misunderstood president. He was. He was. <laughs> but, but, but you're saying it's hard to... I'm just saying um, uh, uh, too much idealism and too much uh, uh, sort of um, youthful inclusiveness doesn't always produce what you want it to produce. Now, maybe it's just because I'm 75 that I'm saying that, but that's what I think. Well, it's an interesting thing. We started off talking about the election of 1800 and the, the battle between the Federalists and Jefferson, and the big, the other contentious issue was in a vision of the people uh, and an attitude about the people, whereas Jefferson thought the people would always make the right decision, um, that the Enlightenment as you had an enlightened class of people, people, you know, he was for a public education system, and thinking about the future, that, that the people would rule, and the Federalists had a different <laughs> view about that, that maybe, I, don't, I think it's probably apocryphal that uh, Hamilton said the, the people are, are a great beast, um, but that attitude is that, you know, you, you don't wanna go too far off in democracy because you will end up in a situation where, um, sometimes mob rule un, and you know voting, people voting with the sort of sensibility of mob will vote people in and do things that are not best for the country. So that, this whole question about the attitude about democracy and representation in the people has been here from the very, very beginning in the 1800 and it would be interesting to have them you know, back looking at this moment, particularly now, to see, okay, Federalist, Repu Democratic Republicans, look at it now, who, who was right on that question yeah. of how to calibrate uh, uh, representation of the people versus... No, the calibration is the, right, is the right word. Yeah. I think that's yeah. right, yeah. But you used an important word when you talked about Jefferson's vision of populism, and that was education. He thought that people had a duty to educate themselves for citizenship and to mm -hmm. defend mm -hmm. liberty. In that sense, would he have been a fan of unchecked Populism? Well, well no, um, he wasn't a, a fan of unchecked anything, but <laughs> but for the most part, he well, I know he did think that there should be a new constitution every 19 years. And I, I think he overestimated 
how involved in politics people were gonna be. I mean, his vision was that of participatory democracy. Everybody would be as excited about having the United States of America as he was. And to say everybody will want to be involved, everybody will, you know, participate, and they will do all of, you know, everything that they could, and not just he wouldn't think that people would kind of zone in every four years, and you know, pick one person. So there was this real sense that everybody was going to be engaged in a way that really hasn't turned out. So, with education and love of country, patriotism, and a desire to control your own, you know, your own destiny, people would be involved. And that, that really hasn't happened to the extent that I think he would have assumed. The numbers are startling. 80% turnout in the election of 1840, according to the exhibit, and much lower mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. That's 80% that's of white males. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a somewhat, you know, I'm not sure you can compare that number. Maybe you can. Mm -hmm. You talk about Jefferson's desire for frequent constitutional amendments, and I was struck by... No, the frequent constitution. Frequent constitution. Con conventions. Conventions, mm -hmm. new constitutions entirely. Yeah. In the exhibit, you're just reminded, between the 20th Amendment and the 27th, uh, those passed in a short period of time, and there were just a whole bunch, starting in 1961 with the... Uh, God, I can't read it all with my glasses anymore. 28th, uh, uh, no, no, that's, it's... it's. Uh, I sympathize. Yes. <laughs> Basically, there are about four amendments that are passed in the 1960s alone, mm -hmm. having to do with 18-year-old mm -hmm. uh, voting mm -hmm. rights mm -hmm. and presidential succession and so forth. Why is it so much harder to pass amendments now? Mm. I think people, I ask my students um, if they would want a constitutional convention, or what do they think about amendments? And I think people are frightened because there's mis and people are mistrustful that if you open if you open things up, it might get who, worse. who knows what exactly? Yeah. The devil you know is better than one you don't, yeah. um, and unless it's something that's really, 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 really serious, they're not gonna um, they're not gonna get involved in it. So I I think that's it, it. The system was made for it to be difficult to do, and I think we sort of settled into this this period where the Constitution is seen as sacred in a way, but it was also it also grows out of our sort of mistrust of one another, and we don't think we're going to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. Something that's you know that's hard is an amendment, not a law that can be passed, but an actual amendment to the Constitution uh, would meet a very very high standard. Some have suggested that from Trump on the right to Sanders on the left, the populism they represent doesn't put the Constitution at its core. They're not really talking a lot about the Constitution or, or, or not focused on it. Um, is that fair, Jeff, Jeffrey Ward? And, and is that, has that been the case with populist parties throughout American history? I don't know that I can answer that. But I, but I do think people are not talking about the Constitution. I don't think, um, as I said earlier today, Mr. Trump has ever read the Constitution. I don't think he has the slightest interest in it. Um, he knows, he knows the phrase Second Amendment because he knows that's something that all those people shout about. But, I, you know, he, he, torture is fine and, and worse torture is finer. And uh, it's, he's, he's just hitting hot buttons. I don't think there's a discuss. And to me, that the irony of that is that a lot of the people who are signing on for that side of things think somehow it's strict constructional uh, constitutionalism, which it isn't. What do you think? No, I agree. It, well, it's not strict constructionism. I mean, you know, you, it's very difficult to, uh, you can't have religious tests for things. Um, and yeah. yeah, the 14th Amendment is pretty clear about birthright citizenship and all. So I don't, I don't think, I, I mean, I don't know if he's read the Constitution or not, but I don't, I don't think that's twice. something, huh? Not twice. Not twice. <laughs> he hasn't done it twice. Um, but you know, I don't think he feels that that's that that's necessary at this point. I mean, um, I, you know, I mean, he's he's done. They've both. They none of them. I mean, they've done well, sort of without it on on all fronts. And so, yeah. in terms of campaigning. And so I don't, I don't think it's, it's necessary, but we're just, this is early on. I have, you know, we've got a long way to go. I mean, uh, uh, Sanders uh, has a standard thing he does in which he says this country was based on the principle of fairness. That is not how I understand American <laughs> history. So I don't think either of them is paying much attention to the... 
Well, he's not, well, he's not paying attention to the. Con that's not. That's not the Constitution. He's probably getting that from the Declaration, okay. um, and the notion that all men are created equal. Mm. And so I think that's probably what he's alluding to, which is not. But am I wrong? Which is not wrong. Yeah, but you're not. You're, you're not wrong. But that's what I think. That's what he is. Yeah. He, he's he's um, appealing to America's creed, uh, and that's what he thinks he's doing. But that's not the Constitution. Well, to the degree that Jefferson believed that democracy could not survive ignorant and free, mm -hmm. and that citizens had to be aware of the Constitution in order to protect liberty and participate in democracy, uh, aside from wildly supporting the National Constitution Center, what can we do to promote constitutional <laughs> education? Well, one thing we can stop doing is to really protest when people try to get rid of history in the classroom. Um, I mean, I know STEM is important. Amen. STEM is incredibly important, but this is, it ought to be seen as a bedrock. It's a part, bedrock part of citizenship. And I don't see how, I mean, we need STEM and those things to stimulate the economy for people to make the inventions and the things that we can sell overseas. But how we govern ourselves is dependent upon our understanding of, of our history. And so I would hope that you know, people would protest against all efforts to make that more difficult for people to, to attain, knowledge that makes more difficult for people to attain. So parents and grandparents and other people, you know, if you pay attention to your school district, pay attention to what's going on there, I, I think that's really critical. It's, it's, it's shameful um, that there are efforts to uh, lessen the teaching of history in American schools. It's a bedrock. Amen. Amen, and I do have to put in a plug for those of you who haven't heard this before, the spectacular new interactive constitution that the Constitution Center has launched, which brings together free and online the best liberal and conservative scholars to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about, we really think is a civic tool that can transform uh, constitutional understanding in America. Check it out at constitutioncenter.org. We want to bring it to every student in the country. We have a bunch of great questions uh, from the audience, and several of the first ones have to do with the Electoral College. Uh, we ask, uh, the audience asks, what parts of the electoral process are prescribed by the Constitution and what parts can be modified by the people? Is the Electoral College optional? Uh, please comment on the value of the Electoral College in 2016. Are we in for a crisis in this cycle? And someone else asks, what's the purpose of the Electoral College? What does it serve today? Why was it created uh, and what happens when the people's choice is not the Electoral College choice? Not me. Not you. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, well, it's, it's done to balance out power between small and large states, and s small states are never going to agree to give up, um, you know, their power, their equal, you know, the representation, the way it's done. So I, I don't think it's something that can be, that's one electoral, that's an amendment I just don't see, you know, coming forth, <laughs> actually. Uh, I just don't see how that could, how it, how it's like. It's, it can be done, obviously, but politically, I don't, I don't see how it could be achieved. And everybody complains about that because it's odd to have a popular vote, uh, have the popular vote not determine um, on the election. But you know, I, I think small, smaller states um, have power, uh, and that they're not going to, that they're not going to give up. And that was part of a, a compromise at the very beginning. One of the big battles of the, uh, of, of, you know, the ratification was about slavery, but it was also about the relative power of you know, huge states like Virginia versus Connecticut and so forth, and this was all part of that mix. And I, I don't see how it could be, how it can be changed. There is a proposal. Politically. Th there's, there's a proposal, which as you say is politically uh, unre difficult. unrealistic, difficult, for states to make a pact that they'll allot their electoral votes proportionately to correspond to the winner of the popular vote, and if enough people, if enough states sign on to it, then it might be worth the others to yeah, yeah. jump in. But well, hard lift. That, that's hard. That's a very heavy lifting. That's yeah. A very very heavy lifting. I, I mean, we see the handful of examples where the there's been a loser of the uh, popular vote who's won the presidency through the electoral vote. Mm -hmm. um, have, have people accepted it with well, good yeah. grace? I mean, I mean, people accepted um, Bush v. Gore. I mean, people didn't go out into the streets, really, uh, not seriously out into the streets. And Gore came out and told people, you know, this is not to do it. I mean, and don't, because that's, as I mentioned before about Washington leaving, that has been a sort of saving 
grace here. Um, one of the difficult things for any society from ancient Rome, ancient Rome, they killed each other <laughs> to get from one person to the next. How you get from one person to the next is really, really important. And when it has been important in American history for when, you know, when the process works itself out, even if people are upset about the outcome to say, you know, if this is the legal way it's resolved, we're gonna, we're gonna stick with that. Imagine nowadays, Jeff, uh, say that this election ends without a winner of the Electoral College majority and the election goes to the House. I'm just as a hypothetical. Um, and the House uh, chooses Speaker uh, Ryan, uh, which it might well do if it goes to the House. So the president, President Ryan, uh, has not been running and the, uh, say, D Donald Trump comes close to winning a majority but doesn't get it. Uh, would the country accept that? Sure. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I think so, but I, it would certainly be startling. Um, yeah. and well, what, I, what would you think they would do? I'm not, I know I'm not supposed to be asking you questions, but I'm so you lucky. must have. I don't, <laughs> I don't, you don't have to have any opinions <laughs> yeah, at all. No, I ask the expert. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't be an expert on that, <laughs> on, uh, on whether or not the country would, would accept Ryan as president. I, I, you know, I think if people thought that that was the way the process could work, we probably would. I think we would, too. And it sounds to me that there are no previous examples of Americans rising up in violence in a similar situation. It's not in our culture. Not in it. There was a threat. Um, there was a threat um, in 1800. Some people talked about it, um, uh, you know, if Jefferson didn't prevail. Um, but not, it didn't materialize as any, any serious thing. Right. It was more just a threat. Uh, Jeff, here's a great question for you. What was the most successful third party run for the presidency? That must have been Theodore Roosevelt, which you've talked a bit about, but have there, have there been others? Or well, the most successful third party run for the presidency is the question. Was that indeed Theodore Roosevelt? Yeah, I guess it would, I guess it would be Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what, anything come close to him? John Anderson did pretty well, I learned from the well, exhibit. Got 20%. Yeah, Perot got 20%. 20%'s not bad. No. Nope. Yeah. Um, uh, when, oh, my, this is so sad, I've got to, uh, you gotta bring the, your glasses. the glasses and the mic what? and the cards all at once are, <laughs> <laughs> require more dexterity mm -hmm. than I have, but here goes. Yeah, just do it. Go ahead. When did full fierce campaigning become acceptable? What were the circumstances? Uh, well, Brian, full, right? Well, yeah, Brian, uh, Williams, Jennings, Brian. I think Matt Martin Van Buren had some people who campaigned for him pretty fiercely as well. But it would be Brian, um, but certainly nothing like what we have now. Tippecanoe and Tyler, too, they all had these interesting slogans and stuff like that, but Brian is the one where they actually... And, 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 Brian, and what, Brian did it because he didn't have any money. Yeah. And he didn't have newspaper support. Mm -hmm. So in those days, those were the things, you still needed money and you needed... Um, you needed the support of half the newspapers in the country because the papers were very partisan. Mm -hmm. He didn't have either one, so he had to go out on the road. So he made 25 speeches a day, mm -hmm. and he ate, I've, I've never forgotten this, he ate, uh, in order to keep his voice going, he ate bowls of uh, radishes and ice water. I have no idea why that <laughs> helped him, and it must have made him very unpleasant to be near, but he... <laughs> We had a, a, a lunch to open the exhibit, which had, which was totally politically balanced but nutritionally appalling. It was Obama, uh, chili, and Eisenhower uh, uh, apple pie, and Republican and Democratic food, and it was very nonpartisan but but pretty heavy. Um, speaking of Brian, technology matters. Jeffrey, we, we were talking about the Brian Taft election, where the candidates would have records played of their speeches. These very technical speeches. Taft talking about the. Uh, uh, income tax and, and Brian about the gold standard and they'd be interrupted by Tarara Boumdie and people would just sit listening to these legalistic records of the candidates. So it seemed much more, w would people have the patience to listen to such well, records today? Those records can't have been very long. So I, I think it must have been kind of a stunt. Uh, you know, uh, those early wax records, they only last a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. 
So it wasn't a long speech, I don't think. Now, the, the Lincoln Douglas people, when they got to debating, those things went on for hours. Well, if you th what else are they going to do? I mean, this was the entertainment yeah, for the, of the era. That was yeah. the show of the era. Right. You're living out in the middle of nowhere in the country, and then yeah. you've, these people show up. Um, it's like going to church. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, back in, you know, in black churches in the South, I mean, you know, they started... 11 o'clock, end at 4 o'clock. I mean, people would come from other places. It was, you know, a, pla a gathering uh, place. And then um, uh, right now, we don't really have time to do much of, much of anything. We sort of run from one thing to the next. And that sort of news cycle that I'm talking about yeah. fits our, our um, sort of very quick way of thinking and way of living, quick way of living. There is an important theme that's emerging from this con uh, conversation, and the transformation of politics into entertainment really has transform the way people elect our president. That's the, uh, we were, I was speaking to some teachers this afternoon. That's the thing about debates now that is so depressing. The questions are part of the show. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a newsman asking a question. It's how can I formulate this question so that it will get ratings along with its answer. And it has almost nothing to do, it seems to me anyway, with whether you can do the job of president. It's just awful. There's one tonight, there's one tomorrow. Don't miss a one. <laughs> I have, actually haven't watched them this time that much and probably because of that, they just don't seem real. I mean, I get the reports of them later on. I used to watch them, you know, pretty religiously uh, when they were out, but now I, I just, it doesn't I was, do it I, for me. I was just old enough to be absolutely dazzled by Jack Kennedy. And so I watched all of those debates, and I thought it was, it set a wonderful precedent, and I think it was an absolute disaster. I wish to hell it had never happened, because we, it's now the pre presidency has nothing to do with whether you can outthink Chris Christie, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, or get Marco Rubio to repeat himself at all. It has nothing to do with that. So you have to go through all of that. You know, it's like you're going to be a, a, a soprano at the Met, but first you have to prove you play lacrosse. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, they don't have anything to do with each other. Are you sure? I mean, don't, <laughs> do, don't you have to continue to be authentic and bond with the people and, and so forth to be a successful president now? The, doesn't the social media... Do you think, do you think de debates show that? I don't think they show that. Well, let's... Uh, uh, this next question sort of relates to uh, this one. What are your thoughts about social media dumbing down our population? After all, how intelligent and thoughtful can you be in a tweet? I guess we'll find out after this debate when we see how we've done. But yeah, I don't. Do you have somebody tweeting? tweeting? No, we don't. But speak. someone probably is. Yes, please <laughs> be kind. Please be merciful. But, 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 but boring. But, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. But but this is you know this is an important question. We're talking about the relationship between technology and democracy, and Annette, you've begun to touch on this. But do you think the the the, the tweetosphere is is fundamentally changing campaigns? Well, it's changing them because, as I said, it sped everything up you know, exponentially, I mean, how quickly you have to respond to things. I'm not sure, social media, I don't know that it makes people dumber. It certainly drives people to their own little bubbles. Mm -hmm. I mean, you tend to, I, mean, I notice the way I use social media. I, you know, I, I'm on Facebook and I have a very, very small, relative for Facebook, really small number of, of friends and most of my friends all kind of believe the same things. Yeah, sure. And so, although there's sort of a, there, there's a political split now that I'm, <laughs> that's sort of developing, but I think the sort of like-mindedness of it, you don't, you can go into your own world and only read opinions that are just like yours. Yeah. And um, that's, that's problematic, I think. And TV is like that too. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can watch Fox News or you can watch MSNBC or at least the old MSNBC, I guess they're trying to be mm -hmm. more even-handed, but that tends to be the one I would watch mm -hmm. of those two. Mm -hmm. But um, it's sad that there are only those two. Yeah, yeah. 
There are interesting studies about this. Your colleague uh, Cass Sunstein has claimed that people now live in filter bubbles where social media reinforces their previous point of views. But other studies commissioned by Facebook and others suggest there's less political segregation on Facebook than you think, although people get most of their news through sharing. We're going to have an incredible Freedom Day on April 13th where Facebook is co-sponsoring here a panel on the future of online speech, and they're gonna give a presentation about how speech polarizes on the internet and how to combat it, so come back for that. Well, one thing I will say quickly, you know, one thing, everything old is new again. Um, you mentioned before, newspapers used to be partisan. You had the Pike County, Ohio Republican. People knew yeah. right up front what they were getting. So maybe in those eras, if, if, if you were a Republican, that's the newspaper you would take and you would get all of those views. You would look at the Horace Greeley's paper or whatever. So there was, a, there was just a moment when there was this, if you say pretends to objectivity or, or, or aspiration to be uh, objective. Um, and now we've sort of moved, maybe we're moving back to 19th century when you know it was a Republican, a Democratic, and you knew what you were getting. Nobody was there pretending that they didn't care and you're having to sort of read between the lines to figure out what they actually thought. Well. This, I'd love to keep this uh, going all evening, but we have more drinks and the need to end on time. I'm gonna ask for closing statements, and it's a sort of open-ended question, but I'm really curious in your broad thoughts. There's much anxiety in the land today, and anger, and talk about how things are worse and more polarized, and this election is more fractious than ever. It's a version of the question I began with, but as you think about uh, these, this election in the course of American history, uh, do you, are you optimistic or, or pessimistic, Jeffrey Ward? Goodness, those are my choices. <laughs> or anything in between. <laughs> how are your feelings historically? As a historian, how do you view this election? I don't know. I've never, I, maybe it's because of the media, maybe because of it's the immediacy of it, but it does seem more grim and fractious and ignorant than, than other elections I remember. And I remember some pretty crummy ones, but, but uh, this one I, I find depressing. I won't say pessimistic about I'm not pes I'm never pessimistic about the country, but I, it, it is a grim time, I think. Well, I'm, I'm perplexed because you know, I understand that you always want to be better and you want to strive. I, I don't quite understand why people are so damn angry you know, I don't, I don't, other than a sense of being, um, you know, out of, I, I, I don't get it. I'm, this is one that I, I'm puzzled by. I mean, it's, it, they're not great times, but the economy is kind of slowly moving back. There's some sort of signs that they're, you know, of problems ahead. But it's not a disaster. It's not 2008, 2007, when, you know, you know, Law students and people were fearful about jobs. The, the jobs are beginning to rebound in certain areas. I think young people are concerned about what they're going to be doing in the future. There's there's a problem. What are we going to do um, for young people? But I don't I don't understand the actual anger. You know, I could see being passionate about stuff, but but the notion that we're at, this is the temple of doom and everything is terrible now um, strikes me as a little odd and. Um, so that I, I find myself a bit, a little bit perplexed. Uh, well, our historians may be depressed and perplexed, <laughs> but they have illuminated this topic in such a wonderful way, and they've reminded us that the best thing we can do in these anxious times is educate ourselves about the past so that we can understand the present. You can do that by going to the exhibit, go online, read their superb books. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Annette Gordon-Reed and Jeffrey Ward. Thank you. And please come out for some more hard cider and Tip Canoe and Tyler Tubus and some more some more partying. Thanks. <laughs>